Okay, we're in uh, Romans chapter 1, um, and we're in the second half of uh, that chapter. Um, so I think a good place to start would be to read the chapter. Um, I have to say, it starts dreadful, and gets worse, and you'll see what I mean as we read, read the verses. So Romans chapter 1, and we'll, we start in uh, verse 18. Uh, the, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of men, who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as, as God, nor gave, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the simple desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is, forever, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the clear penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So, I'm going to split my talk into four bits. Um, one is the story so far, that's like introductory. Secondly is um, the unmistakable evidence, and that's based on verses 19 and 20. And then thirdly, not giving God his rightful place, the negative choice, and that's based on the, the rest of that chapter. And then my fourth title, if you like, is giving God his rightful place, and it's basically a forward look. So, just uh, thanks to Rob for covering last week with the overview of the whole book, um, and also uh, covering the, the first uh, part of chapter one. So that, that's quite a big ask. Um, so we're, we're in a good place. Um, so just to remind you that the book was written to uh, believers living in the, in. Uh, Rome, right at the heart of the Roman Empire, uh, right at the heart of a pagan culture, as it happens, and they were a mix of uh, Jewish believers and Gentile believers, and that's reflected later on in the Book of Romans, where there are some differences in in views, depending on people's background. Um, But that first half of the chapter starts with a really great statement, um, and it's about the gospel. Um, And the thought really is that we have a great gospel We have a great and powerful gospel. Um, And it has the ability to save people. Um, They need the information. Uh, You can't become a Christian until you've got the information. Um, And the gospel is information about the good good news about Jesus Christ. Um, And we should be uh, bold in proclaiming it. Uh, We should be upfront uh, about the gospel. Uh, and I think we are in days where people are seeking more, more than they did at one time. 
uh, and people talk about spirituality, um, and that, that's quite a recent thing. And I think with the whole two years we had of COVID has caused people to ask questions as well. Uh, so I think it's out there uh, that people are seeking. Um, and the gospel is what, what they need to hear. So let's talk about the unmistakable evidence. That's my first big, big chunk, if you like. Um, and it says here that there's no excuse. God has already revealed his character to us. And how has he? Now, if I was talking about the evidence for the uh, existence of God, um, I would be talking about the three C's. Uh, now, I'll be talking about creation, I'll be talking about conscience, um, and I'll be talking about created in the image of God, th those three C's. It's another sermon. I'm not going to go there now. Uh, that's a separate sermon. It's, it's, uh, it's a whole thing in its, its own right, uh, evidence for the existence of God. But I do want to talk about creation. Um, and as you look at the universe, there is design in the universe and uh, particularly if uh, you are any, have any scientific background at all or have looked at sciences it kind of confirms it uh, that there is design in creation and I just want to take three examples and this really applies all the way through from the very big down to the very small i.e. from the cosmos right down to subatomic uh, scale so I just want to give you three examples of um, the creation and really how it shows design and how it shows the, the handy um, the, the handprint really of, of a creator. So I want to talk about how big is the universe? How big is it? Now it's actually ha very hard to get your head around it. So the first thing I should point out is that very big distances when you're talking about the universe itself uh, are measured not, it, people try and measure in kilometers or miles, but actually it, the numbers are so big it doesn't mean very much. So they actually measure in light years. So perhaps I need to explain a little bit about what on Earth that is, because you talk about so many light years away. What on Earth does that mean? Um, light is the fastest known thing in the universe in terms of how fast it travels. It's 186,000 miles per second, which sounds fast. Um, so if you look at the, on an increasing scale, we're on planet Earth, our nearest neighbor is the moon. And the moon is about one and three quarters light seconds away. So if you remember the Apollo missions, some of us are old enough to remember those. There was a tiny delay, and when they were on, uh, up on the moon, Apollo, uh, I don't remember which ones they were, um, Apollo 11 certainly, uh, they say, um, we we touch down Houston and there'd be a beep, and there was a little delay before base could respond. And that lag is, is due to the distance that the moon is away from us. It's about 240,000 miles. The next major body that important for us is the sun and we actually see the sun as it was eight minutes ago that's because it's eight light minutes away that's that's the distance now a nearest star from from us is four light years so the distances start to get really big four light years so we're seeing that star I think it might be Alpha Centauri but I'm not dead, dead sure uh, we're seeing it as it was four years ago that's a weird thought isn't it because that's how long it's taken the light to get from the, the solar surface to, to us. So let's extend it out and think about the actual known boundary of the universe. <coughs> um, so here we go. I'm going to quote. The, the reason we know about it is because the Hubble Space Telescope has been in orbit since uh, 1990 and it's, it's taken these wonderful pictures of deep space and all the galaxies and so on. Um, I was going to mention actually if you've ever sat out on a dark night and looked out at the sky, you actually get a sense of all this, if you've ever done it. Um, it happened to me September 1974. I was on a Christian conference, and I was on, on the wilds of Scotland, north northwest of Scotland. Not, a lot, not much habitation, not much light, and this particular night was really, really clear. And I just remember looking up, and it's astonishing. It was just bright lights. It was bright and the whole sky was filled with, with, with lights. Um, some of them were satellites, some of them were planets, and some of them were, were stars and solar systems. It was awe inspiring. So if you've ever been there, you've already got a sense of, of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, so just a little bit of science here. Astronomer, astronomers have peered out into the vast expanse and spotted what they think is the farthest and oldest galaxy ever observed. Um, and this is mind blowing. 
the galaxy has been called GNZ11. Uh, so that's the one. Might not have a flashy name, but it appears to be the most distant and oldest galaxy ever detected. Uh, scientists have found astronomers, astronomers led by uh, Kashi, can't even say his name, Kashikawa, a professor in the Department of Astronomy at the University of Tokyo, embarked on a mission to find the universe's most distant observable galaxy to learn more about how the universe formed and then when. From previous studies, the galaxy GNZ11 seems to be the furthest detectable galaxy from us at, wait for it, 13.4 billion light years. And there is a distance that doesn't mean anything as well. You, you can measure it in miles. Oof, the universe is vast. That's God. That's God's creation. God the creator is creating that. Let's go down to the end of the scale, subatomic. Okay, now in school you learn about atoms, hopefully, and you understand that it's a, a small central nucleus which has got uh, protons and neutrons, and it's, it's very dense. And then you've got a huge amount of space, and then you've got the electrons uh, in their different orbitals. The electrons are tiny, and they're moving very fast. Um, actually, the electrons and the interaction of electrons in different atoms is, is really responsible for the whole chemistry. It's all to do with, with how the electrons interact with each other. And electronics as well. That's all to do with the movement of, electronic, of uh, electrons. Uh, so that's the classical model of, um, of an atom. And we've had that. That's been around about 100 years now uh, that we've known that. But actually, the scientists tried to drill down and discovered that the atom is far more complex than that. And it consists of huge numbers of subatomic particles. And you may have heard of the CERN accelerator, uh, where they uh, subject atoms to a huge amount of energy and basically smash them up and then look at the bits that come off. That's, that's basically what, what they do. Um, and again, you may remember this. Um, let me just quote again. This is to do with the Higgs boson. Now, this, this at the time was called the God particle. And actually, it was the missing bit they needed to substantiate their th subatomic theory, that there were all these particles and their interactions. And there's a particle that had never been detected. Okay, this theory, the theory required it, but it never actually been detected. And eventually, it was. Here we go. A problem for many years has been that no experiment has observed the Higgs boson, that's, that's the missing particle, to confirm the theory. On 4th of July, 2012, um, the experiments at CERN's Large Hadron Collider announced that each observed a new particle in the mass region around 125 GeV, which I think is a magnetic field force. This particle is consistent with the Higgs boson, but it will take further work to determine whether or not it is the Higgs boson. Yeah, of course, uh, predicted by the standard model. The Higgs boson, as proposed within the standard model, is the simplest manifestation of the Braut -Eng Englert Higgs mechanism. Other types of Higgs bosons are predicted by other theories that go beyond the standard model. Uh, on the 8th of October 2013, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded jointly to the people I've just mentioned for the theoretical discovery of the mechanism that contributes to an understanding of the origin of the mass of subatomic particles and which recently was confirmed through the discovery of the predicted fundamental particles uh, by the experiments at CERN's Large Hadron Collider. So they picked up the Nobel Peace Prize for, the, for their efforts. So atoms, you thought, mm, that's mind-blowing, but you tr can drill down even further. It's God's creation again on the subatomic scale, submicroscopic scale. Now, if you go in between the two, so you've got the, ver the very big, the huge, and the very, very tiny, um, is the most complex machine in, in the universe. I've already mentioned this once before. Any idea what I'm talking about? What's the most complex machine in the whole universe? Yes, but more specifically. You're right, you're, you're exactly on the right track. Human brain, yeah, it's sat inside your skull is the most complex machine in the whole universe. So let me give you another quote. Yeah, it's a human brain. Uh, and it's to do with, um, again, you may be aware that the human brain consists of nerve cells or neurons. And there's loads of them and they interconnect with each other. And these are the cells that are going to process all the information. So they're responsible for your voluntary movements, they're responsible for memory, uh, they're responsible for decisions, they're responsible for processing information, um, they, d they do the whole job. We found that on average, uh, again that these numbers are so huge, it's hard to take in, we found that on average the human brain has 86 billion neurons, so that's how many cells you've got in, nerve cells uh, you've got in the brain. 
You've also got glial cells as well, and about a similar number, and they, they support the nerve cells, but that's, that's another story. Though, uh, yeah, okay, originally there'd been estimated 100 billion, 86 billion seems to be the accurate figure. Then the nerve cells interconnect with each other. Um, they, they actually branch the, the, the axons. Again, you need to understand the structure of a nerve cell, but you've basically got a cell body and a long axon that actually transmits an electrical signal and connects with other nerve cells. Uh, and they branch and sub-branch. Um, so you've got a huge network. Uh, computers have got nothing on this, I tell you. 100 trillion is the minimum number of neural connections or synapses in the human brain. That is at least a thousand times the number of stars in our galaxy. British researchers reported uh, that genes involved in the working of synapses account for about 7% of our genome. So quite a lot of our genome is actually dedicated to getting the human brain wired up correctly. Well, so that's God's creation. Um, and the thing that really hits you whenever you study any branch of science actually is design. The universe looks designed. So it does imply a designer. Uh, and Romans 1 says, it's, it's obvious, it says, since what may, what may be known about God, and it's talking about the creation, is plain to them. In a way, to me, it's obvious. It is plain to people. There is no real excuse. I um, mean, over there out there, we've got people who are not sure, and we also know out there we've got confirmed atheists as well, who's saying, they basically could be saying, it's, it is all random. Um, we can explain it all. Actually, they can't. Um, but the evidence for God through creation is, is really, really obvious. So that's that section. Uh, Going to move on to the next section about not giving God his rightful place. So given that God has revealed himself to the human race uh, through creation, and the evidence is obvious, as I've been trying to uh, explain, and it's plain to them, what's the response? How do people respond to that uh, knowledge, to that evidence? And there's a verse of decision here, and it's verse 21. It's a dividing verse. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but the thinking became futile. Now, you've got, you've got, a, cho you've got a choice here. The positive choice isn't in this verse. But you recognize as a creator, you recognize who God is, and you can choose. Yes, Lord, I, I do acknowledge who you are. Uh, and I do give thanks, and I do acknowledge, um, give, give praise to you uh, for the wonder of what you created and for the wonder of who you are. That's a choice. Um, but these verses here talk about the negative choice of, of denying it. See, God is at the center of his creation. God is the creator at the center of his creation. And it only really works if God is at the center. And people make a choice and take God out of that equation and don't have God in the center. And actually, it then all goes pear-shaped. And that's really what the whole of the second half of the chapter is about, is it going badly pear-shaped. And I think it's where we are in the world as well, or a lot of it. So we can either glorify him as God and give thanks to him, or not. So what are the consequences of deciding the no, the no route, uh, of, of denying that God is there? We are made in the image of God, so we are image bearers uh, but we as a race as a human race have chosen to rebel and do our own thing and go our own way uh, it's been quoted many times but it's the Frank Sinatra song um, I, I did it my way and it gets quoted at funerals I can't get that I've been at funerals and people quote yes he did it my way and I think no 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 didn't well, why wouldn't you do it God's way um, but that's right it's a natural thing it's I want to do it my way it's that's perfectly natural to us and then verse 18 says that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. Yeah, right at the beginning, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of men. So how is the wrath of God being revealed from heaven? So just three brief ways in which that's actually shown. And these are talked about later in Romans. So we've got Romans 5, 12 to 14, which I'm going to quote. So you notice Romans interconnects and different bits connect with each other. Uh, 
So Romans 5, 12 to 14, it says, and this is something we're going to come to. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. We are spiritual beings. We're created in the image of God. We are spiritual beings. And yet, uh, as a result of sin, and as a result of uh, separation from God, we die spiritually. And that's, that's the death that's talked about here. So that's, that's one consequence. Another consequence, if you like, uh, of the wrath of God is to do with suffering. And I, I do need to explain this. Romans chapter 8 and 18 to 21. I'm just going to quote that. And again, this is uh, one we're going to come to later in the study. I'm just trying to work out where to break in. Here we are. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory revealed to us. The, creature, the creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present moment. So creation is broken. Now we sang earlier, all things bright and beautiful, and it presents the bit about God's creation that's wonderful, which is correct. But actually we live in a broken creation. It's, it's, gone, it's gone pear-shaped, as I said earlier. Not that God is judging directly, but it's a direct consequence of man's decision to rebel against him. Um, and there's something called the fall of creation. Uh, they all went wrong. And then the third consequence, um, or the third evidence of uh, God's uh, judgment on mankind is evil behaviour. And that's talked about in detail right through the rest of this chapter. And I've got to touch on it. I don't want to dwell on the thing uh, that, that much. Um, but uh, evil behaviour follows. How can we tell if a particular society has uh, rejected God? And we see here a progression as you, as you follow the chapter through. Um, and you've got sexual immorality is talked about here. You've got uh, homosexual behaviour as well. And you've got uh, antisocial behaviour. Those, those are the three main areas it talks about. And in the context in which Paul wrote, which was in the Roman Empire, it was showing evidence of, of these things. Um, the, the Romans lived in a polytheistic society what I mean by that is if you're a, a Roman citizen, typical Roman, you would actually believe in a great variety of different gods. So the Jupiter was one and the Bill sorts. And what they tended to do was adopt local gods. So if they occupied this country, which they did, um, and the native people um, worshipped a particular god, they would just bring that one into the fold. So it really was this weird um, match and mix spirituality. Um, but actually, I think we're there now, actually. I think what we have now is really similar. Uh, that people sort of, sort of think, make up your own spirituality. Um, and this we have got in our, in our society. I, th I think we're in a real mess with this. I'm thinking about the LGBT uh, agenda. Um, and and this, this has been progressing really over the last few years, but we have really got into a muddle with things, even in terms of gender identity. Um, I, I, it, it, I mean, where have we landed? And I think it just stems back from this initial rejection of God, that if you don't have an absolute basis for, for things, then it all goes to pot. And I, I think we're in that, in that situation. Okay, I don't want to comment in any more detail about that, but uh, it does follow. Uh, if you take God out of the picture, uh, then other things come in. Uh, 
It says early in Romans that claiming to be wise they became fools. Proverbs 14 verse 12 says there is a way that seems right to a man but, it's, uh, but in the end it leads to death. You might remember old um, Rolling Stones number from the mid-60s, Satisfaction. Um, I can't get no, I can't get no, I can't get no satisfaction. And the 60s, of course, was the era, if you like, of sexual liberation. So it seems like the two things do, do go hand in hand. So I thought, this is a terrible place to finish because we have got to recognise that sin is reality, and Romans makes it really clear. The picture improves after this, but we have got to recognise that sin is real, and that sin has serious consequences, and the first few chapters of Romans talks about that. You've got to get that, otherwise you don't really understand why Jesus had to die on the cross, and why there had to be pain for sin. You have to get the seriousness of sin, you have to understand that, to realise why, why something had to be done about it. And the, the, the good news is that God intervened and he has done something about it. But that background uh, that the human race is sinful has got to be recognised. You have to get, got to get to grips with it. And really that's what we're doing this morning by being in, in this second half of, ch of chapter one. So I just want to do a forward look. And my forward look is called giving God his rightful place. This is really about not giving God his rightful place, but giving God his rightful place. And there is a, uh, there is a solution for sin. Um, and God is more interested in mercy than he is in judgment. Let me give you a couple of verses. Micah, yeah, they're both from the Old Testament. Micah 7 and 18. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Sin is awful. Sin is bad. But God, but so here, God delights to show mercy. He's more interested in mercy than judgment. Ezekiel 18, 23. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the sovereign Lord. Rather, I am not pleased... Um, sorry. Rather, am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live? God is looking for repentance. He's looking for a change, change of heart, a change of mind. So the rest, the rest of the book of Romans, or the rest of this half, first half of the book of Romans, is about how to get right with God and uh, how, that, how that can be achieved. How can sins be forgiven? And how can we come into fellowship with God? It kind of answers that question. I want to, I want to really finish off with a, a visual aid. Right, recognise that? Okay, glove, hand, glove, hand. The glove is a created object that's actually made for the hand. Okay, and that, that only really makes sense when it's there. That, there it's fulfilling its function. That glove really only makes sense. Otherwise, it's just an object in your pocket or cluttering up your house. That glove makes sense when it's doing its proper job. And its proper job is to be in close fellowship with the hand. I, hope, I don't want to push the analogy too far, but I hope the analogy is obvious. God is the creator. We are the created beings. We are the image bearers. We are intended to be in close fellowship with that creator. If we're not, then it starts to go wrong and things start to break down. Um, Rob last week mentioned um, um, Augustine of Hippo. And the famous quote from this, this Christian, he said, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And that's, that's a profound statement. We are restless until they rest in you. Um, elsewhere, somebody quoted about the, the, the God-shaped vacuums in, in, in the human heart. Uh, but just, just think about that. That glove is intended to be in close fellowship with the hand. That's, that's its purpose. Uh, and we are intended to put God at the centre. Uh, God is at the centre of, of his created universe. That's a fact. Uh, but people treat, treat it differently. And they try to substitute other things in, in his place. Um, and it works best when God is at the centre. Uh, now, 
we are those who've made a uh, decision about this, and uh, hopefully we are of the company of those who acknowledge God and praise him for who he is. Uh, but you still have a choice. It's, it's, it, you've made that decision. You've heard the gospel and said, yes, Lord, I want to walk with you. Uh, I want to please you. But actually, that's an ongoing decision, isn't it? To be in that position of, of putting God first and putting him at the centre. Um, so, let's, let's pray. Lord, uh, we just walked through chapter 1 and this litany of sin. Uh, it's just a dreadful world. We recognise that. Uh, sin is, is, is horrible. It looks attractive, but it's horrible. And it takes us away from you. And it just causes a mess. And uh, causes a mess in relationships, a mess in society. And yet, Lord, you do have the solution to it. Uh, uh, you are the centre. God is the centre. Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the gospel. Thank you that he came and made that payment for sin, for our sin. <coughs> uh, that our sins might be forgiven, that we might be in fellowship with you. And I pray, Lord, that we would be like the, the glove that's in close fellowship with, with the Creator. Thank you, Lord, for the reality of the gospel. And uh, just pray, Lord, that you'd motivate us and strengthen our resolve uh, to walk with you and to put you first. Amen.